So my talk is called Can Woolly Mammoths Save the World? And uh, I considered it calling Can Woolly Russian Geophysicists Save the World, but it was too late to change the title. This is um, Sergei Zimov and his son Nikita. Um, and they have this plan to restore the mammoth steppe ecosystem, which was this ecosystem that spread from Spain all the way to Canada. And it was a grassland, and it was full of like big, hairy beasts like woolly mammoths. Um, and they think that by restoring this ecosystem, they can prevent permafrost from melting, which will in turn prevent this catastrophic global warming feedback loop. Um, this is what the mammoth step might have, might have looked like. I, I think this story is, to me as a filmmaker, is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's, um, I mean, it's a story about a DIY attempt to stave off the apocalypse, which everybody loves. Um, but but it also makes an interesting thought experiment, because um, you know, it's what is our, in, this, in the Anthropocene, in this era when humans are having this totally unprecedented impact on the rest of life on Earth, what is our relationship with the rest of life? And what do we want that relationship to be? And I think this kind of addresses that. Last summer, I went to Siberia to meet Sergei and start filming. Um, we take a lot for granted in America. In Russia, when the airplane lands, everybody applauds wildly. And you kind of understand why when at the end of the runway, there's like all these wrecked planes bulldozed into the bushes at the end of the runway. And Chersky, the town they live in, it's an interesting place. It's kind of this like abandoned Soviet ghost town in the middle of nowhere, five and a half hour flight from the nearest town. It's also interesting because um, it's essentially sitting on top of this 500 foot deep frozen compost pile, which stretches to the horizon. It, it stretches beyond the horizon. It stretches across time zones. And um, as Sergei says, the permafrost will melt, and there's only one theoretical chance to mitigate this melting. Um, and to put this in perspective, there's something in the range of 750 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere currently. And um, there's something to the range of uh, uh, 1,600 gigatons of carbon locked up in permafrost. And Sergei was actually one of the people that first figured this out, pointed out to the world. People just didn't know there was all this carbon in permafrost. Um, and, and the implication of this is, if and when it melts, as Sergei says, we're in deep, dark, woolly mammoth doo-doo. <laughs> There's a lot of research going on trying to figure out exactly what's happening to permafrost. This is the eddy flux covariance tower. Um, I turn the volume down. Oh, well. And um, it's actually measuring CO2 concentrations and methane concentrations. They, um, they liberated this from a nearby military base. And when they lowered it down, they um, weren't so gentle. You can see it's pretty crooked. It's a little bit terrifying being up there. But there's like super important research going on with this tower, with um, American researchers and European researchers. NOAA's involved. When Sergei, back in the 80s, he like had these first epiphanies about the mammoth step and about the amount of carbon. And the first thing he thought is this doesn't add up because the current ecosystem in the Arctic is this incredibly low productivity ecosystem. It's like mosses, lichens, a few berry bushes, and larch trees. A lot, a lot of larch trees. You, like, you hardly see wildlife in Siberia, largely because poaching is pretty bad. Um, and so by, by productivity, we mean like sheer photosynthetic productivity, like a plant's ability to take energy from the sun, use that to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, <clears throat> and convert that into you know, sugars and starches and like the, the body of the plant. And as Sergei points out, the reason why plants grow incredibly slow up there is because it's cold and things biodegrade really quickly. So these larch needles, they could be like five years old and they still look like larch needles. So like the nitrogen, the phosphorus, all the nutrients these plants need to grow are bound up in these needles and they're not available to grow more plants. Where in a herbivore grassland ecosystem, grass grows really quick it gets eaten by an herbivore. Inside an herbivore's belly, summer or winter, it's like 37 degrees centigrade year round. It's full of bacteria. And in that temperature, stuff breaks down really quick. Stuff breaks down in a matter of hours. And those nutrients are again available to plants to grow more. And so during the mammoth step, it was like 2 million, you know, the, the Pleistocene was like 2 million years. Um, and, and soil just was built, layer upon layer of soil of like, you know, horse dung and roots growing and like some dust blowing in. And, and this is how this 500 foot deep compost pile got constructed. And they did some really fascinating research. This is a Devani Yar in a Rodin river bank on the, on the Kolyma River. And um, a lot of bones wash out of this river bank. It's just like packed with animal bones. And so they assembled all the bones from a given area 
and after a lot of math and statistics about like animal, average animal life expectancy and the distribution of bones and like how likely they are to survive, they came up with um, herbivore density. So in an average um, square kilometer of, of Siberian lowland, there would have been one woolly mammoth, five bison, eight horses, however many reindeer that is, and a few other species in lower numbers like musk ox and stuff. Um, Sergey is also like, very convinced that humans are responsible for wiping this out. Uh, the same applies to North America. Um, and, and this is like disputed. Stas Gubin, the fellow in this photo, is actually a very respected scientist who disagrees with Sergey about this. Um, but Sergey's theory is that the, this cycle was broken. It was like this, you know, these complex nonlinear systems and you upset it and it finds a new equilibrium. So without animals to cycle nutrients, the grass couldn't grow and animals couldn't recover from overhunting. Sergei says that he had this epiphany about the mammoth step sometime back in the 80s, and he, um, he immediately went and got a herd of horses, like the next day. And his son Nikita says, like, it probably wasn't the next day, but it was, was pretty quick. And he bought this herd of horses, they're local, um, Yakutians keep them, and he let them loose in a meadow near his house. And he didn't build a fence or anything, because why would they go anywhere? And the horses weren't like privy to his logic, and they promptly made this like 500 mile trek back to their home pasture in the dead of winter, like walking down frozen rivers and stuff. Um, so Sergei had to start over, and he, he, got, he got more horses, and he built fences this time. Um, he built fences, and he started getting other animals, and it's kind of this like Arctic Noah's Ark, woolly Pleistocene thing he has going on. So this is a European bison, it's a kind of bison. Um, a baby moose. Um, the story about how they catch the moose is really funny, but I can't tell it now. Um, a musk ox, they nearly died, him and Nikita, taking this like, little boat to Wrangel Island off the northern coast of Siberia to pick up these musk ox because they didn't have money to fly them in or anything. Um, and and th there's a few other species they got too. Elk, the elk actually like, jumped over the fence and ran away. There's a bunch of caribou or reindeer that you don't see very often. They hide out in the bushes. Um, and so you're probably wondering, how is this going to prevent permafrost from melting? And um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's a simple function. In the winter, the ground is covered by this like, meter-thick layer of snow. In the summer, the snow melts off, and it's sunny. like It never gets dark for like three or four months. And the ground absorbs heat from sunlight, and it melts the upper layer, the active layer, which is where all plants, their roots are, like in this upper meter, a little less than a meter. Um, and then in the wintertime, it snows again and covers the ground, so that heat that was absorbed during the summer it can't escape. Imagine if you had like a, a down comforter this thick over you. Like it, would, it traps a lot of heat. And so what these animals are doing is all winter long, they're looking for food. And you can see they're skinny because they're hungry. And like any blade of grass, if it's there, they're going to dig through the snow and get it. And they've trampled all the snow. So it's rather than being a meter thick, it's like you know, it's 10 centimeters thick. And it has much less insulative capacity that way. And so they actually put um, data loggers, temperature sensors, out in this field. and um, in their control site in an area outside the fence, the, I think, March temperature at a depth of like half a meter or something was negative seven centigrade. And in this spot inside the fence, it was negative 23 centigrade. And even Nikita, I mean, this is preliminary data, so it's not like they're not writing papers about this yet. But um, even Nikita was blown away that the trampoline made such a big difference in soil temperature. It's, it's really important to point out that um, this is not going to solve global warming. We would have to stop burning fossil fuels to do that. Um, is what this will do is prevent this like runaway feedback loop caused by melting permafrost, which could make global warming far worse than has currently been imagined. Everybody wants to know in the title of the talk, um, where do woolly mammoths fit into this? And um, it actually quite irritates the Zimovs. As, as Nikita puts it to me, like a woolly mammoth will be cloned soon. There's people working on it, including like folks right nearby at UCSC. It's not that far out. But it's probably not going to happen in Sergei's lifetime on an ecological meaningful level, like enough woolly mammoths to have any kind of impact. So they hope they're cloned. They'll happily take some. But they're trying to do this without woolly mammoths. And really, they say, is what Nikita said is like, we're trying to clone an entire ecosystem. We, and we don't need one single species to do that. We can do that with animals we already have. It's, it's kind of cowboy eco-engineering, like a lot of other cowboy engineering that's going on there. Yes, Sergei does drive around in a tank. Um, they, um, it's, it's, well, for, for starters, Sergei, he's a very respected scientist, and um, he's, he's, um, 
you know, he's collaborated a lot with a lot of Americans. Some fellow I met at a conference recently was like, like a very respected ecologist was like, Sergey, he may or may not be crazy, but he's probably the smartest person I've ever met. But at the same time, a lot of the science is pretty controversial, and it's like not everybody is in agreement on some of the things he's saying. So in making this film, I, I kind of want to explore the science and explore that controversy, not just like take Sergei's word as the word of God. Um, but the other interesting question is, can they pull it off? Because it's, it's, it's just like this one family in this post-apocalyptic town in the middle of the Siberian wilderness. Um, the, the whole thing is self-funded. It, it's, it's just the family. You know, like as Nikita says, like, my father is the brains, I am the brawn. And, and that's kind of how they roll. In some ways, Chersky is like a good place to do a project like this because no one's looking over their shoulder. They can do whatever they want, which is how Sergei ended up there in the first place, is he wanted to get away from Soviet bureaucracy and he went to a place where no one would tell him what to do. But on the other hand, it's Russia, so Sergei got a herd of um, Canadian wood bison imported. They're bigger than a plains bison and they live farther north. Um, and they got shipped, they got flown into um, Yakutsk and the governor of Yakutia basically hijacked Sergei's bison and put him in his own game park. And Sergei, this was like six years ago, and Ser Sergei still hasn't seen his bison. You know, like how often do you have to deal with the international bison jacking as a work hazard? <laughs> um, and I actually, when I heard this story, I told Sergei that I'm planning on buying this boat this summer. Um, and, and once I get it fixed up, I could bring him a herd of bison. It's, it's only like eight days sailing from Homer, Alaska to Chersky, bypass Yakutia, and um, it would be like really straightforward, and Sergei's response was, uh, I look forward to receiving these bison, but my brain is very important for the future of science, therefore I will not be accompanying you on this voyage. <laughs> Sergei sometimes just seems really, really frustrated that um, people seem more worried about a new iPhone than about existential, uh, existential threats to the future of life as we know it. And He's made it pretty clear that he's um, stockpiling food and vodka and ammunition and fishnets, and that no matter what happens to the rest of us, he's going to make sure that his children and his grandchildren survive whatever's coming. Um, so that's the end. It's not a super positive note. All right, stay, stay up, stay up here on stage. Get, up, get back oh, on stage. Oh, oh. <laughs> So uh, we're going to do a little Q&A, but it does occur to me that most geniuses were thought to be crazy in their own time. So who knows whether it's genius or insanity. I'm pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's both. After, <laughs> hang, after hanging out with them for a month, I'm pretty sure it's both. Um, questions from the audience? One right there. Oh. Uh, Pleistocene Park. Yeah, which is what they call their park. Kind of like Jurassic Park only, Pleistocene. I don't know if that was intentional or non-intentional. Questions? How does he use the tank? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's an ironic point that I didn't bring up. Um, he actually says that the tank is his synthetic woolly mammoth, and he uh, drives it around smashing bushes and stuff, which is what woolly mammoths would have done. Like elephants in Africa are, are landscape ar architects. They open gaps in the forest so other species can grow up. Um, and you can literally see where the tank is driven, the tank tracks, and there's like, there'll be like larch forests, and there's like grass growing up in the tank tracks. Like, like it really has that effect. Um, and, and he says like, only problem with the synthetic woolly mammoth is it does not poop. <laughs> um, and when I was there, unfortunately, I really wanted to film him saying that, and the tank was broken down. Uh -huh. um, and you know, parts are hard to get up there, and they were, I think they didn't need it at that time, so. So well, anyone, any last questions? Um, how long would it take for you to tell the story that you said was really good about catching? Um... Oh, like, I don't know, 35 seconds? All right, go. <laughs> oh, so I guess uh, Sergey and Nikita got in a speedboat and they went up some river nearby. They had to get far enough because there's a lot of poaching around Chersky. So they had to get far enough up, up some river where there wasn't poaching. And then Sergey, like, pull, they see a moose, a, a mother moose and a baby moose on an island. And Sergey, like, pulls up to the island and tells Nikita, like, okay, Nikita, go chase those moose until they run into the water and I'll grab the baby out of the water. And Nikita goes like running across the island and the mother moose turns around when she sees him and rather than like running and jumping in the water, she charges him. And, Sir, and Nikita's like, uh, my father told me to do it. He must know what he's talking about. Um, and I guess the moose like didn't actually encounter him. And finally they jumped in the water and then and Nikita, I guess, jumped in the river after them to keep chasing him out. 
and Sergei pulled up in the speedboat and grabbed the baby moose out of the water and then dragged his son in after him. They're, um, who who, you know, who they, else they, feels they, like they live a very boring life? <laughs> <laughs> the Zima, like, like, like you pointed out, they may be crazy, but they make stuff happen. Like, they definitely make stuff happen. The mark of the innovator. Thank yeah. you very much, Luke. That was wonderful.